All right. Welcome to the museum and for those on Zoom, welcome to our lecture tonight. On behalf of the museum staff and the Nevada Test Site Historical Foundation, I would like to welcome you all to today's welcome lecture. To the museum and for those on Zoom, welcome to our lecture tonight. On behalf of the museum staff and the Nevada yep. Test Site <laughs> Historical Foundation, I would like to welcome you all to today's welcome lecture. To the museum and for those on Zoom, welcome. All right. Um, on behalf of the museum and the Nevada Test Site Historical Foundation, I would like to welcome you to today's lecture featuring Alan Chavez. Alan is a first-generation college student majoring in mechanical engineering at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. During the 2022 summer, Alan interned as a mechanical engineer at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, as well as a researcher at the National Atomic Testing Museum. 
His interest in fluid dynamics has inspired him to pursue a career in the aerospace field. During his lecture, Alan will speak on the geopolitical tensions in the 1960s that led the greatest scientific minds to push the boundaries of nuclear physics, quantum theory, and engineering designs. From design schematics to historical recollections, Alan seeks to bridge the gap between the history of the Polaris missiles and the science that const constituted the necessary means to develop the first generation of submarine-launched ballistic missiles. Alan is happy to answer audience questions at the conclusion of his talk. Do you have a question? Please wait. Um, to ask until a staff member has brought you a microphone. This will allow everyone attending remotely to hear your question. And for those watching remotely, please write your questions in the Zoom chat box and we will be sure to ask Alan the question for you. Now, please welcome me or please join me in welcoming our speaker, Alan Chavez. Thank you. <laughs> Afternoon, everyone. My name is Alan Chavez, and I'm very, very happy to be here. Said I am a at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, in mechanical engineering. And tonight, I'm just very happy to be here in the sense that, given my background in engineering, and I never really thought that I would be at a museum. So many of you guys may be asking yourself, so what is a mechanical engineering major doing at a museum, right? Like Megan said, I had the opportunity to intern at Little, Lauren Vermore National Lab. And also part of that internship was to gain a historical uh, perspective on pursuing engineering endeavors. And the reason why is I seek to bridge the gap between or at least at a glance, you may think that the history is very far away. Right? Um, but through this research that I gained through this past summer, I realized that that's not actually the case. And the way that I'm going to be bridging these uh, two rather disparate topics, I'm going to be using Polaris missile as the glue that will unite these two topics. So without further ado, what I want to do in this slide, I want to set a clear expectations of what I hope to uh, convey throughout this presentation. So to begin with, I want to establish a common ground. And then we're going to explore the history, the science, some of the modifications that were in each of the Polaris missiles. And then from there, we're going to explore how science and history intertwine even up to this day. All right, so to set a common ground, my first and primary goal for this presentation is to educate. If you guys walked out with a little bit more knowledge from this PowerPoint presentation, I'm going to be extremely happy my first and main objective, which was, was the second one, is to preserve it goes a little bit more beyond than just, uh, stating the facts, showing people that were involved in this uh, in our time frame that I will be talking about later. How acknowledging that there was true people just like you and involved in a lot of these operations, people with with families, uh, with us uh, for responsibilities, with mortgages those stuffs that normal people live with, right? Um, but on top of that, they had to live to very um, uh, intense. Rather, it seems like it was a very tense time to be. And then now, a token of appreciation here at Natum and at Leno for taking the time to mentor me and to help me grow, not only as a scientist, in a perspective that I never quite imagined that would be, which is, which was the take that I will be sharing with you guys today. Now, let's start with exploring the history, yeah? So what is the time frame that we'll be talking about in this presentation? Now, this, this is really important because uh, when, we're talking about, when we're talking about the Cold War, it seems like it's like this entire cosmos of history that's occurring at the same time. So for that, uh, we're only going to be focusing on the little time span of this grand which is from 1960 to 1963. And the reason why we're going to be doing that is because it allows us to truly focus and to tru it tru it tru understand what's occurring during small time frame. And now for the second important question that I ought to answer is, what missiles 
So if I may shift the figure on the left right here. So uh, when we're talking about the Polaris missiles, it's important to keep in mind that they were uh, SLBMs. Now, if you may me. All right, there we go. <laughs> sounds good, sounds good. <laughs> All righty, so like I mentioned, so when we're talking about the Polaris, it's important to keep in mind that they were SLBMs. They were submarine launch ballistic missiles. But before that, there was no such thing as a SLBM. We, there was only uh, ICBMs and uh, anything that had to do with air artillery, right? So what that means is that in terms of uh, nuclear uh, diplomacy and in terms of nuclear strength, the military only had capabilities in the land and the air. And that's until they asked, okay, what about the ocean? How can we conquer? How can we become more powerful in the sense that we're uh, unable to, we're able to escape any kind of uh, sensors or any kind of devices that will detect us, right? And that's where SLBMs uh, come into play. Right. And as you could see, this trinity or a triad, as we call it, it's a nuclear triad because we could see just like a trinity, there's it comes in, in threes. Right. So we have uh, land dominance uh, and then we see air dominance and sea uh, strength. Right. So that's why the Polaris missile was extremely important, because it added another depth or another dimension of strength that the military did not have before the development of SLBMs. Now, who is involved? Remember, we're only sharing a tiny speck of history, which is from 1960 to 1963. And this is just a little, little tiny dot, again, in the grand cosmos during those times. So for that, um, it's, it's quite um, inevitable to, to realize that it's a highly complex dimension of what's occurring here. There's a lot of people that are at play but for the sake of this presentation, we're only going to be focusing on the two superpowers at the time, which was the United States and the USSR. So that's who is involved, at least for the sake of this presentation, right? And then now, what caused the Polaris missiles to be engineered, right? Now, this is really a quite interesting question. And honestly, it depends who you ask. A lot of the sources have uh, their own take on why the Polaris was designed but at least the ones, the from the ones that I've gathered, it seemed that it was a matter of nuclear deterrence. It was a matter of national security, or at least preserving the national security. And that's what caused the Polaris missiles to be engineered. So for this presentation, we're gonna be exploring about we're gonna be exploring the figures that were involved in the his history side. And then from there, we're gonna dive a little bit deeper and see, okay, what's actually the science that made these SLBMs come true. All right, so now to explain the history. Now, before we try to gain an understanding of the historical side of the Polaris, it is important to step back just a little bit from our given time frame to 1953. And that's where Admiral Robert B. Carney, he was the chief of naval operations at the time when President Eisenhower commanded the United States Navy to join the Army in their efforts of developing IRBMs, which were intermediate range ballistic missiles. But now there is a bit of a problem. The Army was trying to develop uh, liquid based propellants. Now, for those who do not know, propellants are essentially the part in the missile that makes it go, you know, kaboom, right? It's what gives it the, the pushing force in a way, right? The thrust force. Now, all of those conditions were unsuitable for naval purposes just because it was highly unstable and not very safe for the shipmen that were going to be on board where, with these missiles were going to be equipped, right? So for that, the Navy realized that on top of having li uh, liquid propellants when they needed solid propellants, their dimensions of these missiles were completely out of proportion. They needed a bit smaller missiles because, I mean, if you think about it, they had to fit the, uh, they had to put these missiles inside of a submarine, right? So the dimensions had to be extremely precise. There couldn't be any room for error in terms of dimension. Now, Admiral Carney was not 
in agreement with this. He also saw the Navy be, being in a, in a weird state, uh, at least financially. They were trying to put together so many projects, and he felt that uh, trying to add another project on top of what the Navy was trying to do, it just didn't seem feasible in, in an economical perspective. So he actually ended up um, resigning from his position. And that's when President Eisenhower appointed Admiral Burke, which is the gentleman in the left. He was the one who uh, oversaw or took over Admiral Carney in the, uh, uh, let me see, in the naval operations, excuse me. And then now what I found interesting about Burke is that it was more of a management problem more than anything. He realized that, yes, that it was extremely possible for the Navy to develop uh, a submarine launch ballistic missile with the capabilities that the Navy needed, but it was more of like, how can we use our resources that we already have to make this project come true? And then Admiral Burke decided to create a subsection within the Navy called the Special Projects Office which was entirely destined or its sole purpose of existence was to design the requirements that President Eisenhower needed, the ones that he asked Admiral Carney from the beginning. And the gentleman on the right, which is Rear Admiral Raborn, um, in order to kind of like to simplify like their relationship, uh, you can think of Admiral Burke as kind of being the a superintendent, the one, the gentleman who's overseeing the entire operation, who was seeing the entire operation from a bird's eye perspective. And we could think of Rear Admiral Raborn as the, the, the general manager who's on site at all times, who's helping out and making sure that everything's uh, progressing smoothly on site though. All righty, so without further ado, Let's dive a little bit into the science, right? The schematic that I have here on the left shows just a like exploded view of what the, the primary components of the Polaris missile. Now, notice that each component has like a little balloon sticking out of it, right? So uh, going from left, left to right, we could see that component one is the nuclear warhead. Then number two was the, the section in the Polaris missile, which was responsible for all of the controls, which is control any electronics and anything that had to do with guidance. And then moving on, elements three and five were the propellants. If you guys may remember, it's the part that just essentially adds the thrust force. And then element four is just the, the essentially it's just the interlock is what unites both of the propellants. All right. so. What were the main, te main technical challenges that the Polaris faced? Number one, it was the warhead design. Number two, it was the propulsion. And number three, it was the navigation. Now, what I'm gonna be trying to explain, and I'm gonna try to simplify some of the overall concepts that fall within the mechanical engineering side of things, because if you think about it, the warhead had a lot of, of uh, you know, it had a neutron generator that had to detonate at, exact, at a specific time with a certain amount of power, right? Which is a little bit outside of the scope of what I study, but what I do study is something like this, right? So how does the shape of the nozzle affect fluid flow? That's, you know, that's a little bit more my, up my alley, right? So as you could see that this has like a bit of a cone, cone-like geometry, and it seems to be very smooth, right? There's a very specific reason to why that's the case. There's a reason why this, the, the nozzle, it's not flat. It's a, re a reason why it's not circular. Uh, and those reasons stem from a little bit of aerodynamics in this sense, right? If you look at the schematic on the right, you could see how kind of these vort vorticities form depending on what kind of shape is trying to break away from a fluid, right? And now remember, a fluid doesn't necessarily need to be a liquid. It could also be a gas, right? And in this case, we're dealing with air since that's where the, the uh, missile, as it's going through the air, that's the fluid. That's the working fluid, as we call it, right? So now... Uh, if you consider a football, there, it has a really specific reason, just like the missile, to its shape, right? There's, you know, we're not throwing away a, like, like a triangular or triangular prism up in the air because it won't go too far, right? It has a very unique shape because it has a specific aerodynamics tied to that geometry, right? And as we could see, that the goal is to limit the drag forces just by adjusting a little bit of the geometry, right? We could see how, how smoothly this streamlines, the streamlines just being like the little 
lines that go over above the, the geometry, how smooth they are relatively to say a flat plane, right? So with that in mind, Let's kind of continue on to the propulsion design, which is a very interesting challenge that the military hadn't really seen before. And the reason for that is because if you remember, like the, there was no nuclear triad, there was no within the ocean, right? So now they had to consider these two challenges. Now, how exactly can we take this missile and break out of the surface water? So we're below the water now. How can we get the missile out of the water? And then how can we propel it from the water surface? Those are two different things because you cannot ignite a, a, a missile inside of the submarine because that won't be a good thing, right? And then there will be no combustion inside of the water, right? Because there's no oxygen present. Um, so those are very two different problems that require uh, two different working principles here. So now breaking from the water surface. Now it's important to keep the first bullet point in mind. So any fluid, whether they remember it, so it could be a liquid or a gas, can exert a force. Now, some of the properties that govern uh, this main idea is the how, like where is, what, what area are we working in? Like the, essentially the larger the area, the larger the force. Density, and also how fast is the fluid moving? But now you guys may be asking like, what kind of fluid are we working? What, what are we talking about here, right? Now, the way that they, they ejected these missiles out of the chamber was to introduce a highly pressurized air into the chamber. So in the chamber is essentially this compartment. So it like goes inside, right? Now you could see that it has a hatch and the shield. So it's almost like a very, like a, like a, like a thin wrap that can withstand any hydrostatic forces when the submarine is below the water surface, right? So as this would open, the shield prevented any water from going into the missile, right? So that took care of that problem. Now the, high pressurized air that was introduced into this chamber caused a force to propel the missile out of the water surface, which is the original, uh, the, first, the first technical problem that these missiles had to face. And then once it was out of the air, it really wasn't a new problem. This is like just launching a missile or a rocket from like a flat plate, right? Now that the missile was out of the water, it's just simply like Newton's third law of motion, right? For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, right? So as soon as the missile detected that it was out of the water surface, the combustion process began because now there was oxygen that could go into the combustion process and whatnot, right? So now one thing that I do want to point out is this free body diagram, since this is where it starts getting a little bit technical, right? So we could see that this little dot right here is what we call a point mass. It's essentially, if you were to take the entire mass of this missile and compress it into a little, little tiny space. Um, that's, this is kind of what this is symbolizing. We could see that all of the relevant forces are acting only on this little dot. We know that that's not really the case, but it's a simplification to try to understand what's happening here, right? So we could see that the, that the resultant force that's happening, the reaction in this case, it's the thrust force, which is what's propelling it upwards, right? Now the exhaust force is caused by the propellant, by the combustion process that's occurring, right? There's instantaneous collisions that it's happening by really, really, like really hot air that's moving around, which causes the particles to really collide with one another. And it's like when you play, when you play pool, right? Um, when you have collisions between one, one ball and another. It's kind of the same working principle here that you have collision between the atoms that causes equal and opposite reactions, right? And then this is essentially just the gravity force and this is the force of drag. So what this means though, is that the force that's exerted upwards needs to overcome these three forces. If it doesn't, it's either one or two things. It's stable, it's stationary, it doesn't move anywhere or it's moving at a constant velocity. It's one of those two things. All right, and now for the navigation design process. Now this is probably perhaps my favorite part of this presentation, just because at the time, at the 1960 to 1963, there really wasn't any kind of GPS. There wasn't anything that what we call, you know, we can just go on our phone and we could find any particular location. So how was it, how was the position determined with, without the modern computers that we have now, right? And this is where we introduce inertial navigation systems. Now, here's kind of how they work, right? So 
Acceleration is probably one of the most important things that for engineers, as if you know what the acceleration is of a system, you can know anything you want to know regarding the velocity and the position of whatever you're studying, right? So what they did, the engineers at the time, they installed three sensors along each of the uh, spatial directions of the missile. So they had a sense area accelerometer in the X corn in X spatial direction, the Y and the Z. So once you understand, once you can get data for this, it's really mathematical how you can trace back from, from A to V to S, right? So kind of just get an idea for those who are not really familiar with the concept here. So we could say something like this. So this is my original position. This is where I am in my original position. And then now if I move over here, this is my final position, right? So that's just simply what S is, S. We want the position. We want to know where the missile is, right? now. Velocity just shows how quickly did I move from my initial position to my final position, right? And the acceleration, which is essentially what we're reading, is how fast is the velocity changing with respect to time? Now, uh, once you know what this is, you can essentially track the missile in, in space. You have a, uh, you know, a spatial coordinate in each and every single direction, which is extremely powerful because you can know exactly where it is in real time. So this is why I found it very fascinating because there was no need of like a GPS, just kind of like what we have here. This is more to its like fundamental core, like what a GPS is, right? This is how we determine mathematically the position of, in this case, a missile. All right, and then this is just like a little uh, representation of, uh, kind of like what it means to understand how powerful it is to know the acceleration, right? So I created, let me see, I plot. Oh. All right, I plotted a, ran a random acceleration and then know, note that just from knowing what this acceleration is, I can, I was able to just like in a very, like a few lines of code, I was able to determine what the position of like, say in this case, like it's a missile, right? Uh, I was able to determine exactly where the altitude of this missile is just by knowing what the acceleration is. Now, this is just a very like a gross simplification because I only took one like spatial direction. So like, like say X or Y or Z, like just by knowing that, like I was able to accurately measure and, and plot where the missile is in this uh, with respect to this spatial coordinate. So this is why that's extremely important because if you know where the missile is, um, or at least say from a def defense perspective, you, are, you know exactly where to put a counter missile so it, interfa it inter interface and it doesn't cause any damage, right? So this is why this is important. And then it just comes from knowing the acceleration, which is pretty cool. All right, so now let's compare the missiles. Now there was three generations of the Polaris missiles. So the one that I was, the one that I showed in the previous uh, few slides with the, the the schematic with this exploded view, it was the Polaris A1. Now you kind of get an idea by looking at this table, like okay, there's a difference in weight, a difference in length, and the diameter seemed to remain kind of consistent, right? Now the A3 was the one that produced the longest range. And what that means is like, how far can the missile go from my initial position and my final position? Just like we saw in the previous slide where they make mix that arc, like how far is that arc, right? That's exactly what we show here. And we could see that the Polaris A3, it had a range of 2,880 miles, which is pretty insane for the, given the technology that they had at the time, right? And this is just a missile of the A3. So you guys could kind of get an idea of what they look like in real life. All right, so how exactly does science and history intertwine today? Now, uh, a lot of things happen after the Polaris missiles. Now, my motivation for this uh, or choosing the Polaris missiles was because I had the, like I mentioned earlier, I had the opportunity to intern at Lawrence Livermore and they had a lot of um, historical ties with the development of the Polaris and other nuclear technology that was happening at the time. So I decided to choose something that was kind of up, up their alley, right? And then now, um, you know, uh, ever since the development of, of the technology that went into the Polaris missiles, we've seen supercomputers and we've seen developments of really crazy uh, missiles or, or, um, or uh, rockets. And we could see how much we've progressed in that sense. And then really it all starts from just uh, deep historical ties as we saw 
with the Polaris mission. So my conclusion for this was that, or what I gained from this internship was that in order for us to engineer for the future, it is important to understand the past. So thank you very much. And if anyone has any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. This concludes my presentation. <laughs> yes, sir. Is that strictly a uh, ballistic missile or was it guided? Yeah, it was a guided ballistic missile with the inertial navigation system. Yeah. And then the, the tubes that they sat in, you just I just learned that they were not flooded with water at first. They were absorbed air. So that suggests then that you need us if you're gonna shoot it out with a burst of air, that there's some sort of seal around the rocket and the uh, tube. Is that the case or is it wait? So in the seal, you mean the a little plastic syringe with a rubber stopper. You, you, know, you don't get any, if there's no rubber stopper there, you don't get any pressure to push it. Exactly. Yeah. End of it. Mm. So was there a seal around the rocket and the ceiling to the inside of the tube? Or it was below the, the pressurized just came from below the, the hatch, what we saw in the site inside. But yeah, a lot of the, like it was engineered for it to withstand like hydrostatic forces. So it was, so it could withstand as soon as if like punched out of the, the little plastic wrap. Yeah, so it had enough momentum for it to overcome any kind of drag forces introduced by the water itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there, there, was, there was no real seal against, like there was no rubber gasket around the rocket. No, no. Juiced it with a big burst of air. Exactly, yep, that's how it was. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's how it was. So you mentioned interning at uh, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. What did you do during your internship in Livermore? You mentioned your work here at the museum, but what did you do in uh, Livermore? Absolutely. Thank you so much for your question. So if you guys ever come around and come to the museum, or for those who are already here, we have a section that deals with coaxial cables. We see coaxial cables like in our everyday life. We use them for any kind of transmission. That's essentially what they are, they're transmission lines. Now, if we take on the historical take that I kind of wanted to share with you guys today, during the times of nuclear testing, they had extremely long transmission cables. Uh, so in the moment that the nuclear bomb was detonated, it was important to collect data. But you couldn't have like a person to be standing next to the bomb because that wouldn't be a good thing, right? So you had to have extremely long transmission lines that would carry this information. Now, the thing here, or my research that I did there, was to understand like what's how much of how does cable length affect what we're actually seeing at the opposite end, at the the technician, the engineer who's actually looking at the data that's being perceived by the detector, right? So uh, I learned that uh, the longer the cable, the longer the interference interference that the cable is going to introduce to the reading, right? So what I did was to uh, determine or to kind of in a way like filter out that um, the noise that was introduced in the cable and have like a mathematical information. And I plugged out what that noise was. And then I took any random signal and I was able to predict what the output would be without having the physical cable, like without having to run tests, like actual tests with the cable. So essentially I was able to determine how much noise how much uh, detrimental cost is going to affect the input signal uh, without having to uh, test it one over and over and over again. Does that make sense? So essentially, I had to determine how much disturbance did the cable cost. That's mm -hmm. perfect. Thank yeah. you so much. Huh? <laughs> I do have a follow-up question. Was there anything that surprised you from your time either at Livermore or at the Atomic Museum? Did you learn anything that was a little surprising to yeah, you? Absolutely. Yeah. So going back to the technical side of things, it's like it was a bit of a learning curve for me because it was uh, in a sense, I thought that it was more electrical engineering based. But the more I dove into the product, I realized that it's really control systems. Like it's really has to do with signal processing and all this stuff, which is something that we do study as mechanical engineers, right? But at least this is something that I'm currently studying at the moment. So I didn't really know, right? But what surprised me is like the concepts, the mathematical concepts that allowed me to like find essentially the transfer function of this is what we, what they, or cable response of it. Uh, it's like math that was developed by people in the 1800s. 
without the use of modern technology. Like these were people that determined it by hand, like what I essentially did in a computer. So I just thought that like, it took me like a while to understand like what was going on. And for those who are curious, there was Fourier transforms. Like there was people that determined this like by hand in the 1800s without the use of like modern stuff. So I thought that was really like mind blowing. That's incredible. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's pretty interesting to yeah. hear. Absolutely. All right. And there was just one more question. Um, what sparked your interest in this topic and in this field for your career? Yeah. So I always knew that I wanted to do aerospace engineering. Uh, this is something like my reason for um, even studying um, uh, mechanical engineering was originally because I wanted to do aerospace. But now the university that I go to doesn't offer aerospace. So I realized that mechanical is like the closest thing to it. So um, my passion for for at least like uh, defense work was really born after the internship. Like I realized that I really enjoy the aspect of contributing to like a bigger and more meaningful project. Uh, that's something that has really skewed and really like uh, influenced my decision of going into like the um, the national security route of, of things so in the aerospace industry. Yeah. Great, thank you. And one more question. Um, what do you hope to achieve in this field as you continue to pursue a career? Absolutely. So I, I hope to, that's a good question, actually. So I hope to uh, develop faster and stronger missiles for or to protect our nation. That's essentially what I want to do and make them autonomous. So I'm going to be going to Raytheon for uh, missile development, uh, but I'm going to be focusing more on the systems part of it. So from there, I want to transition more to the controls and signal processing of things where I can like, I can truly be at the front end of like, how can we make these like almost like a self-driving car, just like how self-driving cars work. Like how can we make self-driving uh, missiles that are on point accurate and that have fast response times and that there's no room for air and all those stuff. So that's what I hope to do. Faster and stronger. <laughs> So I think we have one more question. Um, what led you to pursue an education in this field to begin with? Oh, gotcha. Engineering. Uh, I would say just like, um, I've always kind of been fond of math from a young age. It's something that I really enjoy. Um, so I realized that I wanted to do something in STEM. I mean, I didn't really know what until like, I remember I was in eighth grade. And then I was like, oh, let me just search up engineering in the internet. And I remember that aerospace engineering was like the first thing that came out. So I was like, well, that looks so fun. Even though like I didn't really have like the middle school that I went to didn't really have like any kind of like STEM programs or anything like that. So like all of those stuff was completely foreign to me. Like I didn't know it was a thing. Like uh, so when I saw it, I was like, wow, like that's actually really cool. So I wanted to um, my my perspective kind of changed over the years after that, like I wanted to be a pilot, but and then I changed my mind. And I was like, you know what? Like, I, I can still be somehow uh, connected to that side of like, you know, being in the in the na in the Air Force and stuff like that. Maybe not directly, but how can I support the mission regardless, right? And that's how I ended up choosing like my my career path. Great, thank you. If we have any other audience questions, all right. Well. Alan, thank you so much for Sorry. coming in and speaking. Um, let's hear it one more time for <laughs> Alan. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, guys, for awesome. All right. And thank you for everyone who is here and for those who are watching at home for um, tuning in to Alan's lecture today. And we hope you have a great night. Thank you again.